recording. Okay. Uh, welcome everyone to the Kubernetes SIG architecture meeting. It is Thursday, July 31st, 2019. I'm your host, Jay Singer Dumars. I work at Google and I'm one of three chairs and uh, going to go ahead and get started. Uh, the agenda is available at bit.ly slash SIG dash architecture. Um, one of the things I put in here just as a quick thing is uh, so our meetings, as we get higher attendance and as our topics get more complicated and contentious, um, keeping the, the time windows for discussions is really difficult. And as a moderator, trying to manage discussions that are going in 100 different directions uh, is incredibly difficult to do. So, and this kind of also dovetails with a lot of feedback I've been getting that SIG architecture starts to feel a little bit more like we're a, uh, Woodshed area, you know, uh, bike shedding and rat holing on things than actually making progress. And there's a lot of things we as a group and team need to, to actually work on and get done. So I'm hoping maybe we can focus on making these meetings a little more action oriented and less discussion. And if there's things we need to discuss, maybe we can move those to the to the um, the mailing list because that that's a little more uh, good for people who want to get their thoughts together in an ordered way. So. I just put a few working agreements in the agenda, uh, mainly just like, let's make feedback constructive and actionable. Let's uh, favor, favor work over discussion um, when we can. And if it's a comment, let's try, um, let's try and put them in the chat. And then that helps kind of writing and, uh, and, and getting that uh, down. And so it's not necessarily having to, to speak it out loud. And lastly, just if you're talking more than listening, just be mindful of other folks who aren't, who aren't talking because we, you know, only one person can talk at a time. So. Uh, hopefully none of that is too uh, radical or contentious. Uh, I just want to make sure that we're, we're doing the best we can to be productive. And man, we have a lot to do and not many people uh, to do it. So let's, uh, let's really make 2019 the year where we start making progress on a lot of these things. Um, and with that, uh, let's go ahead and kick off the talking about the Windows progress. And Brian Grant, you have, are the lead on that. Is uh, AV working in that room? Can you hear us? Yeah, great. Yeah, um, so there was a, a lot of work done on the Windows Cap. The link is in the uh, agenda notes doc. Uh, please take a look. So thanks for all the work on that and to the other folks who helped review it. There is a pretty comprehensive list of functionality that has been confirmed to work or not to work and what the reasons for uh, things that don't work are. Um, as well as a more complete uh, description of, of the effort and, and how the functionality will be uh, will appear to users and how they will leverage that. So, so there are a bunch of action items um, in terms of GA criteria and things as granular as specific tests that need to be uh, written. So please do take a look. There's also work done on the um, Windows group managed service accounts issue and that cap also uh, has been marked implementable. Uh, there's also a link to that in the agenda notes doc, so please take a look. Um, there are some outstanding issues to uh, finish the work on labeling the Linux only uh, tests. Um, so I have been looking at that. Uh, I don't know if there are other outstanding issues, so uh, Patrick, is, are there things that you need more help with or you like, uh, you know, areas where other people can contribute? Yeah, so we, we sent a, um, an email over to the SIG Windows list. Um, you know, Michael actually sent that yesterday. So we're actually increasing the, the frequency of syncs we have. Um, you know, just, you know, we think we've got a good list of issues to uh, continue you know, working through and making progress. Um, but I think we've got a got a clear path forward there, and um, and it's helped um, get get some more people um, across more companies, including some customers, uh, uh, volunteering to step up and help uh, carry this forward. So um, I'm happy with the, uh, the state that we're in right now. Um, I did want to see if Michael had any specific questions if he's on as well. Yeah, as it, it, first of all. Uh... Uh, Yuju and and uh, and Brian, thank you so much for spending a ton of hours with us reviewing the cab and going back and forth and giving your detailed feedback. So we really appreciate that. Uh, we wouldn't have gotten to implementable without you guys. Um, the only one thing that you know, and and we didn't raise it in the cab, 
uh, as much, but I wanted to bring it up here. Uh, we've had a discussion in this forum maybe uh, two months ago where we talked about how a seed cluster lifecycle um, was not supporting hybrid uh, compute clusters where you have Windows and Linux nodes. Uh, as we've mentioned in the CAB, our goal is that we will, we do want to provide full support for that scenario because that's how some of or most of our customers are going to be deploying in. And we've outlined how we want to give them the best practice of using taints and tolerations and how to make that an acceptable solution both for their existing ecosystem of Linux containers as well as for their newly uh, introduce Windows containers. I wanted to bring it up to this forum and make sure if anybody has any questions or concerns why hybrid or heterogeneous clusters shouldn't be supported, please speak up now so that we have at least the next month to address it. I think the biggest thing is just test automation that's reproducible and uh, both, this, both SIGs can inspect as part of the release process or is the big one. Yeah, and, and I think Patrick is working on that with some of the test automation we have so that we are going to be able to assess that scenario working. Um, if you guys have any specific tests that we can recommend and maybe uh, have someone from, from your SIG to, to, to come in and, and a little bit oversee that process without spending a ton of time, we we'll, we'll definitely welcome that addition to help us you know, uh, navigate this and make sure we have a good support story there. Sure. Uh, Tim, uh, you can work with me and Patrick offline. We can figure out who that, that person should be and we can uh, get this rolling. Thank you. Great. The, uh, thanks, everybody, for pitching in on that. That's uh, This is exactly what we're here for as a community is to, to backstop these efforts. Um, any other questions, concerns before we move to the next topic? All right. Um, so... Tim Hawken cannot be here, but Mr. St. Clair, can you uh, speak to the next one or do you want to punt on this until next week? Um, that, is that the CRD migration one? Correct, CRD installation, yeah. So, Tim, has Tim circulated the document here? Um, no. Okay. I, I think we can punt the next week if you want. Yeah, there is a document that we're currently circulating, which is proposals on how we want to manage the installation of core APIs. So I think for today, because we don't have the document circulated, uh, and people haven't had a chance to look at it, that we should circulate that doc with the proposed uh, options that exist. And as a SIGARGE community, we should pick uh, a potential option that we can uh, go with and write a cap around. Because right now, uh, there's a lot of contention with regards to how are we going to install and manage CRDs over time uh, in this sort of federated environment. Okay, great. Well then, uh, we'll take a look at the, actually having a week to review the document would be helpful anyway, so. Um, yeah, so it's, we put it on the agenda for next week. I thought we might discuss like short or medium term options this week and longer term things next week, but we can just discuss it all next week, this was something that was um, anticipated in the architecture roadmap that was written back in early 2017, uh, but we're like way beyond the point where we actually need to resolve it now. So, um, so yeah, we'll try to make sure the doc gets sent out to the list. Great, thanks, Brian. Um, moving on to the next item, which is the future of CSI node info. Um, David, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, great. Hi. Um, so hi everyone, I'm David. Um, this kind of relates pretty strongly to what the previous topic was going to be about, the uh, CRD installation stuff, um, but this is more specific to storage. Uh, so I circulated the document earlier, not sure if everyone got to read it, read it but um, the general idea is that we have a CRD, or we have an API object right now, which is a CRD for storage uh, called CSI node info which is kind of key for a lot of our storage features in CSI going forwards. Um, specifically, the two pieces that we care about most and that this proposal will affect the most are um, entry to CSI migration and CSI topology. Um, so although we do have the planned long-term poll uh, by the TIMS about uh, installing CRDs, we do require a more 
short-term solution. Um, so I outlined two of them. Uh, it seems like we're kind of circling around two uh, possible solutions. One being to move the CRD to a core API, and the second being to kind of hack specific cloud providers, uh, cluster up scripts or deployment mechanisms to install the CRDs by default. Um, but Michelle, I think you have a reason that it should be more of a core API. Is that true? Uh, no, I think I just wanted to, I, I want to be able to come to a decision on which short term solution, short or medium term solution we should take so that we can be unblocked and be able to move these features to beta this release. Mm -hmm. But I think the topology GA and migration and topology GA are both would be blocked on the more long term solution. So we need to work out timelines with that too. So are, are there resource types other than this one resource type, or is it really just one resource type? I think it's just the one. There's the two. Of them. CSI CSI node CSI There's two. So I think the biggest question here is what's the life cycle? Does the life cycle change if it would it be would it be revved independently outside of tree ever? Or would it always be revved with the core APIs and be dependent upon the core APIs? I think it will always be revved with the core with entry because we have entry components that are dependent on it. <coughs> For CSI in particular, CSI itself is an extension mechanism that we're looking <coughs> used to get the volume source implementations out of tree. Uh, so there needs to be a stable common interface for the numerous volume sources that have been implemented. So in my opinion, in, in terms of enabling another extension mechanism, um, if the CRD based management is not ready, the ne needs for this particular mechanism are so critical that that outweighs you know, trying to push hard on CRD for this particular thing. I agree. Uh, that's a long-winded way of saying, uh, if, if we don't have a better option, we should make it a core API, which enables a lot of other stuff to not be core. And I've been trying to hold the bar and not bend on this, but I'm willing to bend if, if we need to. So there seems to be uh, a parallel here, and, and maybe I'm misunderstanding the issues. Like um, when we look at RBAC, um, there's there's a bunch of code and management for essentially a stand, you know, installing and migrating and upgrading the core RBAC rules. Um, could we do something similar for the CRDs for this? Now I, I don't understand all the subtleties around the the ordering issues, so maybe I'm missing something out there. But there are situations where we're managing dynamic objects as a bunch of sort of stock built-in objects with upgrade semantics. Um, which parts of RBAC are? The, the standard roles. Yeah, oh, so you're, the, you're talking about the configuration, not the resource types. Yeah, yeah, but I'm saying that like, like there is like, like that, those standard roles are, are, you know, dynamic objects that are managed, you know, with version and upgrades and all that like managing the, the, the CRD types in a similar way. Is there a parallel there? Yeah, I and mean, we have a few ad hoc cases in the system where things have been done, for example, for the cube system namespace, for the default namespace. Um, you know, most of these are fairly uh, not configuration intensive. They're kind of simple. So having hard coded uh, configuration some, in some core system component hasn't so much been a problem. Um, for other things, we've used the add-on manager, but as the number of different uh, cluster lifecycle tools, um, you know, kind of proliferate and, and evolve and change, uh, it's no longer sufficient to just dump some YAML into the cluster add-on directory and expect it to get picked up by people. I don't think anybody's suggesting the cluster add-on directory is the place for this, and that's not where the standard well, RBAC. Well, I mean, that, where, where are those RBAC roles defined and uh, how are the different tools expected to adapt to them? The, these things are defined in Go code that's built in uh, uh, natively. So it's it's embedded in the API server. Oh. Uh, it is exported 
into YAML files as well for consumption yeah. uh, by external tools. Yeah. Um, those in particular look similar to the CRD thing kind of at a 10,000 foot view, but when you actually dive down into it, um, like the RBAC stuff is purely declarative and we can do things like make additive only changes and take the superset of okay. what it didn't. And so with like the CRD stuff with all the active callout mechanisms, like it, I, I think that's where you run into problems. Well, that seemed to be one of the big concerns for me. Um, so because with the CRD, you have to set up role bindings and or cluster role bindings and rules or cluster rules in order to be able to access them. Assuming a simple case where it's a Kubi system component and you already have a role, can you instantiate a cluster role binding or a role binding for a CRD that hasn't been generated yet? And if not, how do we, then how do we control access, for instance, if we're doing like ad hoc installation? Yes, you can grant access before it exists. So Brian's shaking his head no, you're saying yes, we're positive that it's yes? You can grant access to resources that don't exist. You can yeah, we don't have any referential integrity. You can, you can say whatever you want. And we, <laughs> and we plan to not. Well, it's used and abused to reuse RBAC for non-Kubernetes I, things. I, I actually think that the, R, I, you know, I, I think the RBAC definitions are similar to the CRD definitions and uh, that, launching them in API server is not a good solution. So I, I think that they should move somewhere else. To, to restate that, <laughs> if we find a good solution for CRD loading, wouldn't it also be okay for our back? Yeah, like API server should do the absolute bare minimum, minimum to allow some component that actually can bootstrap the cluster to run. Uh, we shouldn't build the bootstrapping stuff into API server, it's not the right place. This starts to run into the, some of those circular dependency issues though with like if pods are a CRD, right? I do not think that we need to solve that problem today. To but but to I think right that off the bat. if you're saying this bootstrapping mechanism is gonna be responsible for bootstrapping RBAC, like a lot of those RBAC roles are required by things like the controller manager to function. I, I think uh, designing that is gonna take a while, but I don't think it is necessary immediately because we're not gonna move pods to be a CRD immediately. Yeah, that's uh, the discussion so, I think that we're planning to have next week uh, about the long-term solution for CRDs. We don't need to solve that here. Um, the conversation we wanted to have here is in the short term, what do we do to unblock these uh, critical SIG storage features uh, for CSI? Yeah, I, I actually think the add-on directory is a perfectly fine place for it to go. Uh, <laughs> that is where we have it today. The challenges are, uh, in, we, we don't have the expertise to go out to all the cluster lifecycle tools and figure out how to get them to update to I install mean, this. I'll just it's a, it's a very GCE, GKE centric point of view, uh, to be honest, because you control a slash cluster. There's a bunch of consumers that are outside of core that would have no idea what's going on and their clusters would be inoperable, right? The, the uh, okay, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me just I say what I, I was trying to say. I think we're agreeing with you, Tim. Yeah, let me, let me just try and say what I, what I think I said in the comments in this document, which is uh, the, the stuff in the add-on directory is actually not that optional. Like, do you, are you gonna, yeah, it's optional in air quotes, but are you really gonna run a, a cluster without DNS? Like, like uh, people, people run different DNSs though. People could run DNS, different DNS, but, but if you're running a cluster and you're not running the stuff in the default add-on directory, that means you've made some conscious choice about it. Like, you don't have a complete cluster if you don't offer solutions for these well, things. That's true, but different cluster lifecycle tools have different solutions that's to it. it. Yeah. ADM and has I, I hard coded. I think that's config. And installing the networking is another example. You, you, yeah. you know, yeah. We're talking yeah, about it. a new requirement for all cluster add-on tools to say there is a non-optional set of add-ons that you must add, and they are defined somewhere. And I, 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 I don't think this is a new class of things. I think it's just like DNS or no, no, or uh, networking DNS or is new and. Tools like Cubatom have Go code, they don't look at the cluster directory. So we're saying specifically, there is going to yeah. be some place that there is defined some YAML but that you must. So, but so if, you're, if you're an operator, like you made a decision, I'm not gonna run the default thing, I'm gonna write. I'm well, gonna write. so as, as an example, I think the RBAC is one example, DNS is another example, Cubatom has hard coded solutions to those, other tools have other solutions to those. Um, when we added the scheduler component and broke it out from controller manager, which maybe you, you did. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we broke every cluster lifecycle tool in every blog, and this is pre-Kubernetes the hard way, but back then it was easier. 
uh, we broke like all cluster installations everywhere. Um, and this is sort of a similar thing, I think. Um, Great. So really um, my wait, question no. is, is, that, is there an option 1.5? I'm sorry, am I interrupting? I apologize. Yeah, Jordan, Jordan's had his hand up for ages. It's uh, oh, fine. I, I was just going to say that the DNS example is a good one, I think. Like, if we look at the types of things that we have had to do uh, to get DNS, to like a single manifest to target lots of different clusters, you start having to have not just here's DNS, here's DNS that runs a pod, here's DNS that runs a deployment, here's DNS that runs a deployment with an autoscaler component that also looks at the size of your cluster to tune the number of things going on with it. Like, it's it's hard to come up with a one size fits all manifest um, that adapts to all cluster sizes. Um, and if we want a folder like an add-ons folder to be like a bucket of YAML that people are required to either take opaquely and just apply to their cluster, or required to understand in detail to adapt and tune to fit their cluster, uh, like those are different. Um, those are sort of different goals, and I'm not sure which one we're advocating. So right now, what we're trying to come to a decision on is the short term for, for the storage CRDs in particular, which are more of, we need these to be installed on every single cluster as is. Uh, there's, no, there's probably no modifications that you'd want to do. And if you don't have that CRD installed, many of the storage features won't work. So there's two issues. Uh, Wait, so I was on. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, Joe. Go ahead. I think there's an option 1.5 here, and I think that's worth exploring. That again is based on some of the patterns with the the the, the RBAC objects, which would be that there's still CRDs, but initialization of those CRDs is in is actually in the in the in the API server, uh, similar to RBAC, which gives us the option as we develop generic sort of cluster initialization and sort of object configuration, we can move that stuff out and modernize it. You know, it's you know versus creating a new core API. So that would still ensure that these things are created for every cluster, but it would give us the option of actually keeping them as CRDs and and so, an initialization later. <laughs> uh, API server has a I'll, I'll call it a defect where it's not actually uh, there's no it can't take a cluster lock and do something atomically. So over rolling upgrades, uh, et cetera, like if this set changes, um, I expect bad things to happen. I, it, API server is not currently the right place to do this, right? Like you, you want something that updates this once after the rolling up, upgrade has completed. And, and I'll say too, CRDs on their own aren't 100% useful, right? Like I don't, we don't, if there's, if there's webhook validators, we don't want people writing CRDs that don't have the validators because then they're gonna produce invalid CRDs at some point, and then we have to deal with that. So I think like, just lump it into the load the CRDs is not a good answer. I think the first step is everybody who's writing code that deals with a CRD should have an outer if that tests whether the CRD is actually loaded, and if it doesn't, do something simple. Yeah, we need a place right? to run the webhooks. Right, so, so be smart if the, if, the, if the CRDs don't exist, and don't like panic or explode or, or segfault. Um, I, I think that should be a requirement for everybody moving forward. It's it's a new requirement, right? It's a, testing for the existence of a type is not something we've ever had to do before. Uh, Wait, yeah. So um, the other problem we have with CRDs is that generally they're not GA yet. There are a bunch of things which have not been resolved, like conversion between API versions is not done yet. Um, so I, I'm not sure if anybody here knows what that's, the timeline is. That's at least alpha, if not. It's alpha. Uh, work. I think the goal is to get that to beta and one fifteen. That is unofficially what we're working on. So, if the goal isn't to solve using like creating mechanisms for mandatory CRDs today, the goal is to get a mandatory type that your cluster will not work without installed. Why are we mandating that it can't be a core type? Like we know how to do the core type, we know how to make that work today, and if we want to advance CSI to GA, and that's the goal we're going after, why not just make it a core type and solve the problem of how we install mandatory CRDs later, and then use that mechanism for the next thing that comes along? Yeah, I, that's what I'm in favor of that. I mean, like it doesn't. I'm 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 actually fine with that, but I 
would like to advocate for a slightly different position, which is like uh, like a microkernel type thing where there's there's some things that you, you can't run without and then there's some things that are part of Kubernetes, uh, but if you don't install them, things still work. You don't have as many features. Uh, and, and I think the reason this is good is because those things can be developed exactly like uh, just random extensions. I think that's, right? I think nobody's in disagreement with that. I okay. The question is, is it reasonable to push this on CR on CSI team right now, knowing that there's an even probability that it will actually push their release out, their, their beta GA out by three to six months? Yeah, I, I'm totally fine with this not expedient to do this right now. I, I, I'm not going to like push on that. Yeah, so let's uh, time check this. Uh, Jay's posted seven minutes, but I'd actually like to say two minutes. So we can either make a decision here or we can move to the mailing list and commit to making a decision within the next week. I'm, I'm fine. I'm willing to bend on this. Uh, I feel like we're close to having a reasonable model, but we're not there. And so if we think this is important enough, I'm willing to, to, to lower the bar that I've been holding. Yeah, I mean, really for, um, you know, there are increasing security concerns, for example, and a lot of work has been going into cloud provider extraction as well. Uh, between cloud provider extraction and uh, externalizing the volume sources through CSI, we have an opportunity to extract a lot of dependencies from the Kubernetes code base. I think it is a step in the microkernel direction despite the type. And there are other things we can do, like move a bunch of compiled in types into an aggregated API server or things like that. But I think we should explore those avenues going forward. So, and I think, I think we've got two action items, though, that some group needs to take up, which is where do people run webhooks and where do people do things that need to bootstrap the, the cluster? Uh, so I, I don't know if that's a topic for cluster lifecycle or for API machinery, but well, we, we shouldn't drop that on the floor or we're always going to be in this situation. We have an ongoing doc, which you have helpfully commented on, uh, <laughs> not so uh, where, which, wherein we're supposed to be discussing that topic, but the group was assembled sort of as an emergency response to this particular topic, and I doubt... We should do this much, as non-emergency work. That's my point, is I doubt very much that we have the ongoing bandwidth between Tim, Tim, Jordan, and um, Justin to push forward on that. I think it needs an owner, and we need to figure out which SIG it's going to fall in. So yeah. maybe that should be the, the, the ultimate result of that document is which SIG do we think it falls under and what are our uh, sketch outlines? In the meantime, move to let CSI move in tree. Anybody object at this point? Yeah, and I put the general extension management topic on the agenda for next week and we need to at least surface areas that need to be resolved like webhooks and bootstrapping. And okay, and I'm like okay that. with that. Anybody object? I think that makes sense uh, oh, for some design sure. actors specifically. Yeah. All right, barring any objections, and let's you know give it a couple of days to percolate on the mailing list, just so okay. we're, we've got our I's dotted and T's crossed. Um, but thanks everybody for the discussion there. We're going to go ahead and move on. So Jay, can I throw one, one last thing outside? Oh. Michelle and David, can you guys work up a sketch of how you want to move it back in tree? Which API group? Do you want to put it in the storage group? Do you want to make a separate group so that it's easierly separable, like CRDs. Let, let's think through that as a separate doc. Okay, we'll uh, put something together and send it out to CRG. No. So, should this be a cap? Uh, yes, we will. Uh, There's an existing cap which presumably needs to be updated. Exactly. Either way, yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, so the next item actually was sort of general about caps in the release process, and Aaron can't make it. Um, what I'd say is just maybe read through this and take a look. I don't know necessarily that we can cover this fully right now. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, there was also an announcement at the community meeting, uh, basically all significant work underway that we can discover, <laughs> which is itself is hard, uh, is being asked to have it kept in place in the implementable state for 114. So thank you very much for, uh, to Aaron and others. Uh, who've been pushing on that from the release side. Uh, it's caught a number of people by surprise, so the deadline was pushed to Monday. Uh, so, you know, please get on top of that if you were one of the surprised people. Um, our KEP uh, dashboard for SIG architecture is completely broken and out of date. The last time I checked uh, due to the KEP move, uh, in general, you know, I know that 
uh, Tim Hawken was looking at the KEP tool that Caleb started. Um, because KEPs are uh, merged before they're marked implementable and some have open PRs and whatnot, it's pretty hard to just discover all the KEPs that are in flight. Uh, so hopefully the tool can help with that. Uh, the tool that I took a look at, and I understand that Kayla is reworking it when he's here today, um, uh, was mostly about lifecycle management. So it was if you're creating a cat that's going to help you create all the correct artifacts from the most recent uh, template and walk through the steps of things you need to fill out. And if you were reviewing a cat, it had some lifecycle stuff too, but it didn't seem to match the GitHub centric workflow. I don't know if anybody else uses the pure Git centric workflow. Uh, I, I don't. Um, there's a separate tool. There were two tools there. The other one was more of a lint, which I think is actually uh, a good chunk of the value to me is getting something that says, hey, don't merge this cap because these rules haven't been satisfied yet. Like it doesn't have an approver. Um, so I'm going to hopefully be working with Caleb again to look at the next iteration and work through it. Um, if there are things that people who do a lot of KEP reviews want to see out of the tool, you can talk to me or talk to Caleb just in terms of like wish list for your workflow. And that tool is out on GitHub. I'm going to post a link in the chat for people that want to take a look at it and also in the, the agenda. So more people on this, please, the better. Um, it'll make a better experience overall. Um, and let's see, moving on, I lost my tab with the agenda. <laughs> I think it's, uh, Jordan, I think you're up next with API reviews, if I recall correctly. Okay. Um, I wasn't actually sure what uh, we wanted to cover for this. I saw it uh, on the agenda. Uh, I, I can mention that first, since I okay. uh, tagged you on there. Um, you know, in general, we've been trying to figure out how to make the API review process uh, more operate more smoothly and make it more sustainable. Really, a handful of people uh, have been involved. Um, you know, in addition to the KEP tracking board being basically broken, the API tracking board has been uh, very hard to keep up to date manually. There is uh, a PR out to add automation for that. Uh, it would be great if someone from the SIG architecture group could help that along by taking a look and uh, making sure that it addresses our needs. There are over 100 PRs open labeled API change in Kubernetes, Kubernetes right now, and there are APIs in other places as well that need to be tracked down. Um, uh, you know, so I, I thought it would be good to at least take a look at the things in flight and prioritize uh, which ones someone should take a look at and make sure we have people covering that. Uh, there was work that uh, Jace and others did on documenting an API review process, which we haven't really uh, managed to get rolling yet. Uh, I think we need to take another look at that and see what we can do to better scale the process and make it more, uh, more efficient and more effective. Um, so it looks like somebody, maybe Jordan, uh, took a stab at surfacing a bunch of things and categorizing them in the list, so that's helpful. It'd be good just to whiz through those to make sure we have the right people looking at the right things. <clears throat> yeah, so I, I categorize these. Um, yeah, and please uh, add things if, if I miss them. The, uh, the query that I pulled these out of um, is somewhat in flux as things get pulled out and put back into the milestone with the exception and confusion. Um, uh, so just starting at the top, um, the first set was things that are currently beta that are planned or proposed to be promoted to GA in 1.14. Um, some of these are actually very old uh, features that just sort of languished in beta for no particular reason. Um, huge pages, PID limiting, and the pod resolve.conf and persistent local volumes are among those. Um, many of these uh, are uh, proposed to graduate with no functional changes. So the, the current state that uh, they are in uh, has not proven problematic. Uh, but if you have questions uh, or feedback on any of these, I would recommend jumping in, making sure that it is called out in either test or doc 
uh, plans or, or otherwise. Um, Bobby said, oh yeah, pod priority and preemption uh, is the same. Okay, yeah, so please please update this list if, uh, if you see things missing. Um, the next set was uh, things that are not graduating from beta but are uh, continuing development in the beta uh, stage. And so ingress and uh, webhook admission are the two, um, the last one just jumped up there. Ingress and webhook admission are the two uh, biggest ones that I'm aware of. Um, Ingress has languished for a long time in the extensions v1 beta 1 group, and there is a KEP uh, proposing a, a way to uh, recognize what it is, which is a API that is widely used, and recognize what it um, cannot probably be, which is the perfect L7 API that we want from where it is. And so we're trying to figure out a middle ground that doesn't uh, break a bunch of people, but lets us get it out of a permanent beta API group to something that we can say, well, here it is, we support it. If we want to do something radically different or better, we can start that as an independent effort. Um, webhook admission, uh, that's kind of a laundry list of um, things addressing user experiences uh, using the current beta version. Um, people trying to use webhook admission uh, and running into issues or improvements that they needed. And so there's a list of things that we plan to do in 114 uh, that will remain in beta. Uh, CRD Open API Publishing uh, is looking to <coughs> bring CRDs up to parity with built-in types uh, as far as the schema information that it exposes. Um, but that is not uh, graduating out of GA. Like I said earlier, uh, 114, uh, we're planning to make a push to progress webhook admission, and 115, uh, focus on some of the CRD uh, features. Uh, the event API, someone just added, and I don't know what that is. Um, uh, the event API was redesigned uh, over a year ago, and then um, Implementation kind of stalled. The API actually then did get implemented, uh, but it wasn't adopted anywhere in the system. Uh, so now uh, we have a contributor who is working to change some of the existing event generation uh, call sites within the project uh, to the new event API. So it's really the first use, I believe, of the new API, which is intended uh, to address a bunch of problems. There are some things that have come up, some performance concerns that people are working uh, to address, but the hope is we can make the events much more useful by uh, making common event content um, more explicit in the schema of the event type. Um, so just a quick clarification, I think we are still in the phase of like, recruit writing the library itself is not yet in the phase of switching the existing events to the new API. Oh, okay. Well, thanks for that clarification. I thought somewhere I saw something being changed, but maybe it was a test or a prototype or something like that. Yeah, it was some kind of prototype yeah, to see if it works, yes. Yeah. Um, to be clear too, as we are going through this list, uh, some of these are uh, much further along in uh, towards the requirements that have to be met by Monday as far as having a design and having it reviewed and approved and merged. Um, some of these are likely to uh, not be there on Monday. So uh, if there are ones that you care about, um, please go look at them. And if they are not close, um, let the people involved know or take ownership of that. And if they are close, um, please help drive them to closure this week. Yeah, I mean, this is really an example. You can look across this list. This almost certainly isn't complete. Uh, the project is in desperate need of some project management. So if that's something you want to help with or you can find someone to help with, uh, help with that, um, please reach out. Because things, 
a lot of things don't make the release, not because someone's not working on it, but because due to lack of coordination of the things that need to come together to make it happen. Um, and that can happen for big efforts like Windows, and it can happen for smaller things too. Right. I would also add that um, adding more API reviewers and people who can sort of level up eventually and get to the approval status is going to help us as well. Yeah, to that end, I was actually going to say something at the end, but that's a good uh, segue, so I'm going to say it now. If, uh, if you are involved in one of these areas and would like to shadow uh, an API review or know someone who would, um, we are looking to develop uh, a deeper bench for API reviews. And so all of these things, if they're going to get in, an API reviewer or approver is going to be looking at them. If you would like to shadow that, um, please uh, comment probably uh, in the issue um, to say, when, when this gets reviewed, I'd like to be involved. Uh, observe, learn, give feedback as well. Um, we're trying to build expertise and a deeper bench uh, so that we can get more people being aware of like what goes into a good API, what the requirements are. So, Jordan, do um, you have that stuff written down somewhere, or, or is it? By that, that was the API, the API review process Brian mentioned, uh, which is largely aspirational right now. Uh, it's definitely one of the. As soon as we stop drowning, we will plan out how we're going to swim over the next English Channel. Uh, yeah, so there, there are three, at least three documents. There's the API review process document that Jordan mentioned. There's the API conventions document, and there's the API changes document. Uh, so the ideal state would be uh, that we would have uh, a number of documents at different levels of detail focused on different uh, audiences, like people trying to contribute APIs. That was the intent of the API changes document. People trying to review APIs. Um, the API conventions are both for people writing APIs and people reviewing APIs, making that more concise and actionable with a checklist and also writing some validation tooling. A little bit was done, I believe, in API machinery on that. A lot more probably could be done. Have so, you read both those docs recently? Did both of them? Yeah, so there's a, just a ton of work to do there. You know, as Jordan uh, does reviews, he is adding to the conventions. Like Tim has added things recently also. Um, that's just something we need to get a lot more rigorous about so that we build up that case law and don't have to re-litigate every time. And the linting stuff can catch stupid things like field names not matching basic uh, coding conventions and things like that, uh, which would save everybody a lot of work and time. Would it help if we had, so like there's the, we have the API for conventions, we have the kind of the API review process, but the general knowledge that is I guess most troubling to people who are trying to improve or update APIs is probably what will break us. And I don't know if that's really captured anywhere. Like it'll say use pointers, but it doesn't say why. It doesn't really explain how defaulting actually works. It doesn't explain validation and backward compatibility. Um, do you think capturing that is worthwhile? Or in yes, terms of and everything you just talked about are complicated topics. And I think they are best demonstrated by examples. So when I've been updating the docs recently, I've been trying to provide concrete, artificial, but concrete examples. Of you have to think about what happens when you do X and then Y and then Z happens. Yeah, so the API changes document has uh, some of the, a few of those examples. We could definitely use more. It also has a few gotchas for compatibility, for instance. So these things, you know, every time we stumble on one of these things in a review, usually it's not the first time that has happened. We should flag that and try to go document it. There's a long design documentation backlog of things that I just copy paste from uh, PRs and email threads and things like that, but there's a long backlog. <laughs> um, uh, but I think the other thing about that is, I mean, the more we can make documented or standard boilerplate or have a linting tool for, uh, then the more, the less toil we have and the more time we can spend on the more complicated uh, more specific issues specific to a particular uh, feature, right? Um, so that's really what we're trying to do here is is reduce the toil. So someone's not like spending all their time just monitoring whether things are in flight that need attention, uh, which itself is a time consuming thing right now. Um, but they can actually help those people who are trying to make changes make those in the best way possible. Um, yeah. So. so my question. So is the API review process or, or all of this uh, affected at all by the previous discussion of 
taking APIs and implementing them as CRDs rather than core types. Yes. And could that help with discoverability of API changes right. since they'd be going to a more central place? Uh, right now, it's making it harder because they're uh, spread out across many more places and the rules are evolving. And we need to do a better job of documenting and keeping the rules up to date and communicating those changes, which we haven't so far done. So we probably could do for like a presentation at the, on a regular basis at the community meeting or somewhere else uh, about what has changed in API design land. You know, Tim gave a talk at KubeCon about CRDs are now for built-in things, which obviously we're still struggling with. Um, but that kind of thing, either you know, within the community as well, not just to keep on, is something we need to do a better job of. But as Jordan said, uh, we sort of not need to be drowning in order to make headway on this. And then um, one other thing is, if we're sort of, maybe this is already covered, if we're sort of decentralizing those APIs and spreading them out all over the place, where's the scope fall of what goes under? Or things that are considered part of the project are subject to the same API rules. So all the CSI stuff, subject to the same API rules. Runtime class, same API rules. Third party wants to build database controller, not our API review, but they should certainly read our guidelines because there's a lot of wisdom. Oh, speaking of runtime class, uh, which other types need to be on our radar for hitting the same problem that CSI just hit? Like, what do we think the next? Uh, case of a CRD needing a solution. Runtime class. <laughs> okay. Are there any other types in the migration stuff? No, it's just those two. I mean, the, one of the distinguishing characteristics of the CSI stuff was that it is um, related to an existing entry feature. And so it, 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 we're, it's one we're trying to move from entry to out of tree. Uh, runtime class as a net new thing is something that we have better options for tolerating the absence of more gracefully, right? Fair. Um, um, one last uh, thing to add about <clears throat> uh, the review, in, increasing the reviewer pool is that uh, I know it can be a little bit intimidating and daunting to get into this, but an easy win for somebody just to get more uh, familiar with it would be to partner with Tim or some of the other reviewers and do some of that documentation, like capturing those edge cases and understanding what the rationale is. That's a, that's a low effort, high win thing that helps the community and also would get somebody more familiarity with the, the rationale and understand why these are, are done the way they are. So I would say that um, partnering on documentation is one of the lowest bars uh, that you can do and it's one of the most helpful. So um, anybody who's interested, you know, contact uh, Tim or Tim or, or Jordan or Brian or myself and we'll, we'll definitely set you up uh, and get you poised for success on that. Uh, I want to call out uh, Justin's suggestion from the chat as well to record a video. I think some other similar videos were uh, relatively popular, so that's a great idea. Yeah, I actually, there was a, the Contributor Summit in, in uh, Seattle. I did a, like a live API review session, which I think was recorded. So uh, yeah, if that's useful. You can go look at it. Uh, mostly it was like, I can't understand your comments. Uh, I don't understand how this is supposed to work. It was just mostly stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, basic code review things. Yeah, well, it's like even more important for APIs that people be able to figure yes. it out yep. by reading it. Uh, and then Matt has a suggestion, maybe blog posts uh, for these things. Or like an office hours type of thing, um, like specifically dedicated to API review with it recorded, um, I think would be interesting. Okay, I'll put these suggestions in the notes, thanks. Yeah. They're already in there, I think. Um, and whoever else is helping take notes, thank you so much. Um, okay, so we're on the last topic, is that right? Or do uh, you to Let me run through the rest of this list really quickly. I'll do it in like two minutes. Okay. Um, graduation of alpha APIs to beta. The first one, the CSI topology, was the one we were talking about, uh, proposing to do entry runtime class, um, is continuing as a CRD. Uh, Continue development of alpha APIs for the hey, dynamic. I have a of that. So how are we installing that CRD? Count on manager. Okay. But it's alpha now? It's, it's going, going to beta. beta in 1.14. Um, runtime class is designed to operate if the CRD isn't there. Um, and it just treats it as if you don't have any runtime classes created. Uh, so you just dampen the emergency. 
yeah. So if, if the user is, goes to create a runtime class, obviously they need the CRD first. Um, once there is a control plane component, uh, which there will be at some point, uh, it gets a little more complicated. Okay, so runtime class. But so we'll, let's use that as the lever to have the conversation around COPS and CubeAtom and YAML versus Go and exact versus idea. They're a little bit lower. Okay. Um, there were a few uh, that are proposing <clears throat> field additions to GA APIs. The first is for CSI inline volumes to get parity with um, entry inline volumes. Uh, that, uh, I believe, is merged or close to merged now. So that is looking good. There were a couple questions on that, but is, is close. Uh, user namespace remapping. Uh, from what I can see, that is still relatively in flight, so I don't know if that is going to make it. Um, the next one, topology where service routing, is that merged? I, I can't remember. That one we have the, the API more or less design, but I'm not sure the implementation um, it hasn't been okay. made. Sorry, sorry. Which one? Service routing, topology. Uh, yeah, that is at cap stage. Yeah. The, yeah, I mean, um, the, that also will require a CRD resource for its implementation it, um, in order to do it efficiently. So, uh, it's sort of a, uh, okay. Um, group manager service accounts. Uh, this is actually being done as an extension and for the alpha phase, so there's no API uh, impact for alpha. Um, we are trying to figure out uh, like the, a coherent path forward for representing operating system specific things inside a pod spec. And so this is one of several possible Windows related fields that might make it into the, the pod in a, once we figure out how to, to do that coherently and uh, do that in a way that makes sense uh, with the existing Linux specific fields. Um, and NVAR expansion in volume subpaths. Uh, so, yeah, a way to do NVAR expansion for some patterns. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> the next set are net new uh, APIs. The CSI migration uh, was originally a CRD. It's looking like that will uh, be done in tree to unblock CSI. Server side apply is not a new resource. It's a uh, the moving of the cube control uh, apply function into a server-side API so that all clients can use it. Um, and, so and redesigning it. What? And it's a pretty significant redesign of the entire mechanism. Yes. Um, ephemeral containers, uh, that is currently in the milestone, but um, I, I don't think that will make it by Monday. Uh, the discussion seemed to reach a point of agreement about six months ago, but then kind of stalled out. So if that gets picked up, it'll probably be for 115. And then finally, uh, there's an effort to uh, continue the work to make our components consume structured configuration instead of a trillion flags. Um, so Kubelet uh, has pioneered this. There are a couple components that already consume alpha level API files, or alpha level config files. And so this is, um, taking a critical look at those and uh, reviewing them before promoting them to beta. Um, those may or may not get promoted to beta depending on how that review goes, but this is trying, trying to move that forward. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to say uh, was for planning and allocating API reviews. Um, this is a long list. And like I said, some of these things will fall off this list uh, before Monday, but come Monday or Tuesday, this will still be a long list. Uh, and just getting the implementations done isn't enough if we get to a week from code freeze and they still haven't bubbled up for a review. So uh, let's try to identify which reviewers and approvers are assigned to each item to make sure that's load balanced and matched with the people who have knowledge in that area. Um, let's try to get that assignment done early. Uh, so if you don't have an API reviewer approver, um, work with the people who are on the approvers reviewers list or Jace or other people who have uh, 
thought about how we can load balance this to get those identified early, to make sure we don't slam someone like me uh, with 25 API reviews a week before code freeze. That's it, thanks. Okay, uh, last item is just an announcement. Uh, I turned the Kubernetes scope document that I sent out a couple of weeks ago uh, into a PR uh, and sent that. So there's a link in the uh, agenda notes doc for that. So take a look and let me know what's missing, what's wrong, uh, ask questions. Um, and some people may find it a little bit dissatisfying uh, because it's not like cut and dry criteria exactly, although in some cases there are, like if your Spark is not going to be part of the Kubernetes project. Um, but there are a lot of examples and rationales for uh, past decisions. Uh, in addition to a number of non-technical criteria uh, that have been used uh, for making these kinds of decisions. Uh, so anyway, I mean, hopefully it will help uh, set expectations and simplify some of these discussions uh, going forward in the future. Um, I had found a past email thread back in KubeCon 2017 where I had volunteered to update this. So now I actually did go update the high level description in the what is Kubernetes doc. That would prove to be insufficient. So this is a much more detailed attempt. Uh, previous attempts were in various other docs, which after this I will go update, like architecture.md and the principles.md and the, the long architecture roadmap doc with the layers and all that. Uh, there were a bunch of detailed specific features listed in there. That doc I have plans to overhaul. Probably I'll just write a new doc. Um, but, uh, but anyway, the scope doc tries to focus just on the project scope, so take a look. Great, um, okay, right on time. Thank you everybody for being super respectful. I think this was a great meeting and we got a lot done. And we'll see you in a week. And if you have items, bring them up on the mailing list. Um, Slack is hard to monitor, and we don't have to wait for the next meeting. Indeed. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.